Everybody. Welcome to the show. Hey, hope, I, hope everybody had, had a good uh, New Year's weekend. Did you do anything good for New Year's, Dan? No, uh, I rested up after my haunt. Yeah. That's what I think we were in bed at 10 o'clock on uh, New Year's night. So no, we didn't get too crazy either. We had about, I don't know, 10, 10 little kids at our house and a few friends. And we were all worn out by the time it was even close to midnight, but, um, anyway, you're, you're starting to put the Michigan videos up. Yeah. I got a uh, second one, half one, half done today. Yeah. Uh, had to stop for this show. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do a separate show just, uh, about those hunts uh, later in the week or early next week sometime, just depending on what yeah, the wait till we get the videos up. So, yeah. But part one is over on the Hunt and Beast channel. Uh, if you guys want to go watch that after between now and then, and part two will be up pretty soon. The descriptions and the the link is in the description just to go over there. So yeah, you should um, probably tell them it's a UP hunt. Um, we went up there mm -hmm. to hunt the migration. So I yep. don't want to give any details out right now because uh, uh, nobody's seen the videos yet. Just yep. the first one out. This is probably going to be four videos. Oh, you're going to make. Oh, nice. There's a lot of info in there. There's a lot of uh, mm -hmm. scouting info and and uh, a lot of stuff happened. So, right, yeah, it looked like a a good time. Uh, I was kind of jealous that I didn't get to go up there. <laughs> yeah, it was actually uh, really fun. Um, yeah, I might have to do that hunt again. I mean, it was it was very enjoyable. Yeah, you guys, it's not too far for you either. And Eric goes up there anyway. I think doesn't he every year? It seems like. Yeah, it's five hours from our, our place, so probably 10 yeah. hours from yours, which is a little bit of a cruise. But Yeah. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll quit talking about that, so we'll uh, uh, we'll save that for another episode. We uh, Me and Maddie did an episode while you guys were up there. Did about, you? About uh, hunting, hunting and uh, managing family life. So it was, re it was really good. She was real organized with it, though. She had notes and everything me and you don't do for this she show. She was great. Oh yeah, yeah. We got it. We yeah. I'm glad was, I wasn't on. She'd set me straight because I'm a <laughs> bad person. Today. Oh yeah, it was good. I think everybody that like was interested in it was really it was you know very positive uh, show for them. But uh, yeah, you always got people that are be like you know a lot of comments about uh, just uh, just go hunting and screw the screw your kids and your wife. You know, I kind of. If you, if you uh, look at me, that's my attitude, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Yeah. So I understand yeah. that. I get yeah. it. Yeah. I think I think the problem with that, though, is like a lot of times you kind of later on in life, you wish maybe you wouldn't have done all some of those things, you know. Um, and if you can figure out how to balance that, I don't know. It may just it may turn out a little better. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I feel at least. Yeah. Um, it was good though. She had fun doing it too. She was pretty nervous beforehand, but when she started rolling, she was good. Um, it was it was fun. Anyway, we got a news article that's in the the description below. Um, it's come. It came from Field and Streams, and it's something pretty pretty interesting. And I'll go ahead and share a, share the article up here. Give me one second. And Dan, I think you actually sent me this uh, a while back. I saw it on the internet, but uh, there was a hairless deer killed in um, Illinois. 
this mm-hmm. this month in, in December in their in their gun season there. And uh, I don't know, it's it's crazy looking. And I, I kind of was doing some research on these hairless deer, and like you don't they don't. I don't know. It seemed like the last article about one was back in 2016 or something like that. And it doesn't happen that often, but they do, uh, they do show up and they can be all kinds of things wrong with a mange and some kind of like a, a mite can get in there and cause them to do that. But they are alien looking things. Um, I guess this guy, I read the article and filled the stream and he, him and his son and his dad own a uh, 40 acres and they had this deer on camera a whole bunch and they did. They just thought it was like a weird colored hair. Like he thought it was like a chocolate colored hair. Um, in the trail cam pictures, it looked more like a, you know, just a real dark looking deer. And uh, he ended up shooting it during gun season. And when they walked up to it, they were like, "What the heck is this thing?" You know. And it was it's hairless. It has some hairs on its. I guess its ears had hair in it on it, and uh, its private parts. And then that's about it. He said. If I wouldn't have been out of town and I would have been a little more prepared, uh, a friend of mine, well, a friend from the Beast, he was yeah. uh, a member of the Beast for quite a while. I um, can't remember his real name, but he's got a nickname, uh, Pico. Uh, he's from Missouri. I actually went down there and hunted with him for turkeys once. Um, but he shot a hairless deer in Missouri, and they said it was some sort of weird disorder. And yeah. it's supposed to be incredibly rare. Yeah. And, uh, his really looked weird weirder than the pictures you got here. I mean, it all wrinkled up. Oh um, yeah. There was another, like, a lot of people that said you wouldn't want to eat that, you know? Yeah. There was another one that was from 2016. Um, and it was a spike and it looked, I mean, that thing looked like an alien. And that's the last, last I looked on the internet is like, that's the last one that was shot. At least that people said something about, you know, I don't know. Maybe other people uh, have shot them before, but. Yeah, you're right, though. This one doesn't look as bad as some of the other pictures I've seen of, of deer. Um, but, yeah, the guy said he almost didn't, wasn't going to shoot it, um, or, or they were contemplating shooting it because of, you know, it's a young deer, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then after he shot it, he's kind of glad he did. I'd say that that's a pretty rough way of, uh, to go, like, uh, for a deer living without any hair. Because, I mean, that's, winters and stuff have to be rough, you know. I mean, they're naked, you know. Yeah. Um, I was reading some biologists said that most deer that uh, have this issue um, up north don't don't make it to, you know, the first their first cold spell and everything else. And they end up dying from it. Uh, No, think about the the white deer by me. mm -hmm. Just the fawns surviving from coyotes and stuff. It's a pretty hard life, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Go ahead. Matter of fact, um, Remember when I was talking about that melanistic deer over by me, the black one? Yeah. They're really rare also. Yeah. And uh, I've been trying to see that thing, and it hasn't been coming out where I can see it. It's in a vast area, and there's a couple of fields it comes out in, and uh, it doesn't come into them every night. It comes into them maybe once every few weeks, and you got to be there when it comes out. Um, my buddy lives over there, and he keeps telling me when he sees it because he drives by there daily every evening. Yeah. And, uh, he got a picture of it, but it's a it's a bad picture um, with his phone from all the way across the field of it standing with an albino deer. Really? Uh, man, would I like to get video footage of that? Yeah, it was that's cool. All three kinds: a brown one, a black one, and a white one. <laughs> yeah. And if they can get all like, all together just fine, I mean, I think we can get our you know our lives uh, okay with. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All the different colors of people, right? Yeah, you think so. <laughs> I have heard, I have heard that, uh, sometimes like the, uh, I don't know, bino deer, like some of the other deer will actually like abandon it. Have you ever heard that before? No, I haven't seen nothing like that either. They just mm. seem to all get along just fine. Okay. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't I can't remember. I was reading, a, I see reading quite a bit of them. I don't know if you saw the, uh, pictures that, uh, Wyatt posted recently, but yes, like a group had, of them. Yeah. Cause he, he's right out by me and he, he was hunting right in, uh, the area that's got all the white deer and what did he have like four of them in one picture yeah marching uh, in a line past his camera it was a yeah, pretty cool picture. i'll i'll get on facebook right now and, and i think that'll be a good picture to show everybody um that he white's the one the uh, barber that went with you right yeah he was with me in uh, uh michigan hunt yep yeah i'll find that picture real quick i can't remember what that um 
I just cannot remember the the article I was reading about albino deer and getting um, like kind of being the outcast of a, of a herd whenever they're maybe around you. There's enough of them where it's not weird, but I don't know about that. I just think yeah. that uh, a lot of people think they're an expert, you know. Yeah, maybe so. Here's those pictures that uh, they sent. You can see the there's four of them there at least. You know, I see a lot <laughs> of cool. deer in this area. So I would think that uh, um, I see a lot of interaction with other deer. I, I would imagine the person who wrote this article, how many white deer does he see? Right. Right. Probably so. And maybe I am making this up or something too. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not an expert. I just play one on a, yeah, yeah. a YouTube show. <laughs> anyway, those pictures are cool that they got though. That's awesome. Could you imagine flipping through a camera and finding that where all them deer are all together like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, while I'm doing the video editing, I asked uh, the barber boys for some pictures of their bucks and stuff. You should see some of the stuff they've shot. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. If you flip through their Facebook page, there's a lot of good, good yeah. bucks on there. Yeah. I got to spend a little more time on their YouTube page. I just don't watch videos very often. I'm just so busy. Yeah, I'm the same way. I don't hardly watch any hunting content anymore. If anybody uh, wants a good uh, YouTube channel to check out other than uh, ours, check theirs out. It's Grounded Hunting. Mm -hmm. YouTube at Grounded Hunting. Yeah, they, they have a lot of stuff on there other than just whitetails, too. They look like they had some elk hunts and some moose hunts. Right. And yeah, I mean, uh, they left the UP and went straight to Kansas for a, a coyote hunt. They're there now. Oh, really? And, uh, came off of a hunt to go with me up there. I mean, that's what they do. Hmm. Run around the country uh, terrorizing animals. <laughs> they are, uh, they're, how old are they? They're young, aren't they? Yeah, the the uh, old man's 54. He's a couple years younger than me. Yeah. And uh, he's got, uh, the ones that go on a lot of the trips are uh, Wyatt's, I don't know, I, I got to guess. I think he's around 20, and I think his brother's probably around 17. Um, okay. I might be so they're probably going to be mad at me, but yeah, close enough. Um, they're young, young guys. He's got he's got younger kids too, and the younger kids are uh, slaying them too. I mean, he's got a little girl. I I don't remember what she is like, eight or ten or something, and she's just been killing some stuff like you wouldn't believe. Really? Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, go check them out. Um, yeah. And they live right there in the same county you do, right? Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. hmm. Cool. Um. Trying to think, I think that's all we we're going to cover before we get into the the topic, which we'll probably spend a lot of time on tonight. I'm sure there'll be some questions because it's it's a pretty good one. Um, and what that are we is about? Mo mobile hunting, or uh, I, I was I was going back and forth whether to call it uh, um, the importance of mobile hunting or the importance of the first sit. Um, but it's kind of I thought, well, it's kind of the same thing, really. Do you think uh, we know anything about that subject? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny because uh i've been hunting mobile for years before anybody yeah. even knew what mobile was and when i would talk about mobile people talk to me like i'm crazy and now everybody's an expert on it yeah i uh I, we all, yeah we always hunted mobile too we didn't really call it that it was more like we couldn't afford to buy uh 30 tree stands <laughs> to put everywhere and so we we had one climber and that's all we had you know uh mm -hmm. but no, I think in around when I started, uh, I don't know, essentially when I was able to help my dad and stuff, we started having some permanent sets around. Uh, but for the most part, we killed deer out of climbers whenever I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of, uh, I got to thinking about this topic and I got to like kind of figuring up bucks. And I think all the, out of all the bucks I've killed, which is around, around 28, I've only killed all but two, all but two have been killed on like the first sit. Mm -hmm. um, and I Let's would encourage, see. yeah, I would encourage anybody like think about your bucks that you've killed. And I almost mm -hmm. guarantee they were on the first sit if I had to guess. Well, not necessarily, but the biggest ones, you, you know, like I'm not well, mine. All of mine have been. Well, okay. But yeah. uh, you, you know, when I look back, I mean, I've killed a lot of, you know, average nice deer, you know, like, Pope and young, but just, you know, like 125 yeah. to maybe 140. Yeah. I've killed a lot of those off of multiple sits or whatever. But as soon as I get into that next age class, the deer that I've gotten that are like five or older, almost all of those first yeah. sit. 
either first sit or first sit for the year. And it's spots that you hardly ever hunt. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, I would say that the, the very biggest deer I get are usually in some crazy spot where you wouldn't regularly hunt or you wouldn't even think to hunt. And you're only there because of that buck because they find some niche where nobody goes. Right. Right. What do you consider a first set? Is it like a first set in an area or like the first, like the, the tree? Like, uh, I would, you know, that's kind of a hard question to answer because I would say that the first sit in an area, but the size of an area is hard to dictate. Yeah. I mean, you can be a hundred yards over and be in a whole different area to me. It's one spot and another spot a hundred yards over is uh, educating the deer that you're there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I will say that the uh, closer you get on previous hunts, the less likely you're going to kill that buck. Right. I don't know. I'd have, to, I'd have to rethink about everything if I was going to like just do areas. I was kind of thinking like trees. Like I, I probably killed some deer where I've jumped around in an area. Um, you, know, you know, a lot of times, like, like what I'm thinking when you're saying that is a lot of times I will go and I will purposely go in from a way where I come up against a fence or a tree line where the deer aren't really using my side of the fence or tree line. Yeah. And I'll hunt right on the tree line and try to get close enough to get an arrow in there. And those deer don't seem to know they've been hunted. And then you can literally make another move as long as they don't walk over and smell where you've been. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But if they come through that area and they smell where you've been, the mature bucks will figure you out. Matter of fact, you, you know, you ever check out when a mature buck crosses your track in snow? They follow your prints back and forth, up and down, and they learn everything you, you did. You know, you see it in the morning, you know, after you've been there, and you're like, holy crap, this guy is yeah. just checking out right to the trees, smelling my steps and everything. You know, why doesn't he do that while I'm in the tree? But Yeah, it's all, it's probably, I mean, just like a, we used to run beagle dogs, you know, whenever a deer or a beagle's trying to like figure out a rabbit and they just, you know, mm -hmm. go back and forth until they figure it out and keep going. Um, and then deer's nose is, you know, better. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I was going to ask you too, and this is, this is like uh, a pretty simple question, I guess, but it may be kind of hard to answer. Uh, do you have any like tips for people, uh, to be mobile? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, the biggest one is really think about not hunting the same spot twice, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two is to um, really think outside the box and jump around and cover an area. So um, some of my best outcomes in mobile hunting have been when I know a big buck is in an area and I can't kill him. I can't see him. I'm not I don't know what's going on, but he's there. I know he's in this section, right? Yeah. Whether it be cameras or sightings or or the concentration of his sign, I've got a very good assumption he's in this block of timber, per se, right? Maybe it's uh, 200 acres. Maybe it's 100 acres. But what I do is I'll hunt that area down. So your average guy will hunt the stuff that looks like a deer should be in it and he'll go to that stuff. He'll go to the, you know, you know, the, the deery areas where I would be more inclined to try to figure out what's overlooked. I would be inclined to say, okay, what is it in this area where nobody's going? And that's where I would start. Um, and if it ain't working, I just keep moving. So I'll literally quarter down a, a, an area. Say you got a 40 that could be, you, you know, like, uh, eight five acre spots yeah so in eight days i could hunt that down and know every inch of it right yeah but i'm gonna do it in a manner i'm gonna think about what i'm doing i'm not gonna just go in there and one two three four five six seven eight right and hunt it yeah. in seconds i'm gonna think about well okay which section today is right for the wind um which sections are right and which ones are most likely where i think he's going to be there based on you, you know lack of human intrusion but still having enough cover or uh, typical uh, deer terrain that he'd want to be there. Right. One, you know, you hunt in the five acres, uh, you're going to know if that buck's in there or you're going to know if he's moved through there. So I will just keep hitting those spots and I'm going to go in there from the, you know, wind to nose if I don't know the area very well. 
and slide in there and try to find a spot where I do as little damage as possible, but get into a killing position. I do want to say in mobile hunting that the key to success is to be in the kill tree the first set. Yeah. You don't want to be just off and then make a move after you see them. Now, that might go contrary to some things I've said about observing and stuff. If you can observe, that's a whole different story. Because then you're going in a spot where you really don't think you have a chance to shoot them. Maybe you do, maybe you don't if you're on the other side of a fence or whatever. But your big objective is to see, right? Yeah. So you, you can do that or you can move in for the kill. But it's one or the other. You don't want to... Um, um, what, what, how do people say that? They uh, want to hunt their way in and go in slow and stuff like that. Well, I hunt my way in, but I don't go in slow and I don't go in with a lack of aggression. Because as soon as you slap that buck on the rear and you say, I'm hunting you, yeah, try and kill him. Yeah. You want to catch him completely and totally oblivious that you exist. You want him going through his daily routine where he thinks he owns that little area. Nobody goes in here. Nobody bothers me. And he just comes waltzing out and he gets an arrow through his heart. That's how you want to kill him. Once he knows he's being hunted, it gets very difficult. That doesn't mean you can't kill him once he knows he's being hunted. It just becomes a lot more difficult. Right. And yeah, you have, <clears throat> people that, uh, like we talk about observation sets from time to time and you have to like, you have to commit to them. Like you have to be like, I'm okay with sitting here and not, you know, I'm not probably not going to kill that a deer tonight, you know, that, mm -hmm. and that's hard, although, especially new hunters, you know, that's hard to do, like it's to, to burn a evening. Um, you know, I may have to do it. Like I'm going to Illinois this week and I ever been there. Don't know nothing about the place. Like, probably my best bet starting off is probably doing, you know, if I, cause there's no snow on the ground or anything over there, you know, I, I may have to do an observation set the first night or two and, and figure out what the deer are doing, you know, um, mm -hmm. But if I kind of, like you said, dilly daddle into an area where I'm observation sitting, but I'm also affecting deer movement, that's not really an observation set anymore. It's more of a, you know, halfway, halfway uh, hunt or, you know. All right. So I'm, I'm like just now in, the, in my hunting career, whatever you want to say, just now figuring out observation sets and like the importance of them. Um, and doing them correctly and not, not getting too anxious to like, I don't, I still want to be in an area where I can shoot him, you know, but, uh, anyway, something else I, I, go ahead, go ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead. Well, I was just going to, I had a tip written down, uh, about mobile hunting is, um, something else is like, try to keep it simple, man, anymore. Uh, I shouldn't say anymore. I think humans have been like this forever but like some people make it so complicated with gear and stuff that they have and uh you know i don't know i just just if you have um more than a few things on your body or on your person at some some point in time some of that stuff's doing more harm than good um i, I still to this day i hunt with people that show up with a giant backpack full of crap yeah and you tell them you really need to reduce that uh that down to what's what goes in your pockets and they'll tell you but i use everything in the backpack I'll tell you well yeah hey. yeah um and i'm like like i'm okay if you have a backpack and stuff but man you really got to have it uh if you want to say organized or really have a system that's efficient for you uh i have a really good system and what my system is is i got pockets and each pocket has a thing in it yeah and it always goes back in that pocket, and that way I always have it on the next hunt. Yeah, and you use so that I'm, hunters. Literally, literally um, when I'm hunting mobile, I have a yeah. rope. I have a little clippers. I have a, uh, you know, when I say a rope, it's really more of a string just to pull my bow up. Yeah. I have my standing sticks and a camera arm on my back. If I have a jacket, then it's warm. The jacket's rolled up and on my back. Mm. Um, but uh, some milkweed in a pocket. A uh, clippers. If I'm in the north woods, I have a compass. Yeah. I have a small, tiny flashlight with me. Um. I got a pocket knife in my knife in my pocket usually, but I don't really need one. I need a knife if I kill one. Mm -hmm. I don't need a knife to kill one. 
It's not yeah. like the old days. <laughs> right. But, <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, I have very little with me. I'm a minimalist and uh, I go out there to kill deer. And uh, I mean, to me, it's a chess game. It's a, it's not about, you know, um, am I going to rattle? Am I going to snort wheeze them? Am I going to grunt them? Am I going to do this? I'm just out there to um, catch that deer by surprise, not to fool him, not to trick him, but to get in his line of travel and cut him off and kill him. Yeah. That's the way I hunt. And uh, there are, you know, there are people that are very successful at calling and all that stuff. Um, but you know, when you're dealing with public land bucks and they get five to eight years old or whatever, I mean, it's, they bend down that road. They know those games. Mm-hmm. And to me, the chess game is a lot easier to kill those deer on a consistent basis than to consistently kill them by trying to fool them or trick them or trickery or, you know, being yeah. a magician. I mean, I, I think uh, the problem with all those, I'm going to call them gimmicks. You know, some of them aren't gimmicks, whatever you want to say, you know, calling deer, sense, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the problem is with that stuff is one, they get overused. People overuse calls and sense and whatever. Um, and then just simply like most people that are using that stuff just aren't experienced with it. So they don't understand when the proper time to, to use that stuff is and how deer react to it. Or, um, you know, if there ever is a proper time for some, some of the products that are out on the market now, but, uh, now you, yeah. you've been around the, the, the block a dime or two. Yeah. Uh, have you ever seen a doe that's actually in heat? You mean, sure like, yeah, sure. A, a few times, like. Where we got like four bucks in one area. Yeah, and there's every a, yeah. buck that's in the woods that gets yeah. down one of her or crosses her trail is on her. Yeah. So yeah. Um, when you look at those bottles of scent, put it out and put it upwind of a swamp. If there's a buck in that swamp for, for miles, you'll smell that scent. Tell me how many just run up and smell that bottle. Right. I mean, they work occasionally when a deer is so worked up that they're, they're tricked, but they can smell if it's a real deer or not. And if they're older and smarter and have been around the block, they're going to have a tendency to not get fooled as often. And when they do get fooled, they're going to really check it out, get downwind, be looking in trees. They're going to be, you know, they don't get to be in pressured situations six or eight years old by running into scent bottles, by running up to people calling. I mean, I can't tell you how many times in a season I'm in the woods and I hear rattling. It's obviously rattling. I hear grunt calls. And if I'm hearing it on a regular basis, so are those bucks. Yep. Yep. You still, you, you have your hunter safety system vest that, uh, that old one that has all the pockets and stuff. Mm -hmm. I have, I used to have one of those too. And I love that thing, but I just, if it had, I'd still be using it if it had more zipper pockets. Like I hate that. I've had things fall out of it. I hate those stupid fact, open pockets. Uh, on this Michigan hunt, uh, um, I had people keep giving me my equipment back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you dropped this part of, Hey, you dropped this outside of your truck. Oh, yeah. Man. Like they have really nice, it has really nice pockets like up here, but they're yeah, open. They should and have so, a, a pockets that seal you. Correct. They I should. Know. They'd have a perfect thing right there. If, that, if that's the only thing, if there was like a, Whatever, just something that would close them up. Zippers. I always or... want to design something or make something. It's just a lot of money to make clothing. Yeah, you know, I know. Safety stuff. If you make a safety harness, you got to get it all certified. You got to send it out for yeah. testing. Yeah, I thought about reaching out. I have just some. Um, they're not not really friends per se, but I know some people that ha- own a uh, you know couple of harness companies and just like reaching out to them and seeing them, like they could just like make me something like that, but. Right. I don't know. It's like you said, it's, it's expensive to sew all that stuff in or have all that done. Um, my aunt's really good at like, uh, sewing, I guess, <laughs> whatever you call that. Um, yeah. I thought about taking her one of those vests and see if she could put zippers on the pockets for me. I did, uh, make a vest, um, yeah. an army green vest, um, and got hunting bees printed on the back. I was going to sell them, but it was, Kind of a pain with the sizing, yeah. Uh, but it wouldn't be a safety harness. You'd have right, to have a safety harness separate. But I liked it because you could close the pockets and stuff. The pockets were deep, and you know, I had a lot of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm I like vests. Yeah, I do too. I wear a vest a lot. Um, but 
Anyway, they they say a hunter safety system came out with a new. They have a newer vest type harness, but I don't know what the pocket is. I don't. I have to look at it to see if the pockets are. Yeah, closable. Well, they didn't make anything. it too small. I mean, I, they could make it lighter, but not smaller. I mean, you need you need some pocket room. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I like about it is I have to wear that in order to be safe in the tree. So, yeah, you know, if I have all the pockets in that, it's going to have all my stuff, and if I always have that when I go hunting, I always have everything I need. Yeah, yeah. My release goes in a pocket. My saw goes in a pocket. My clippers go in a pocket. My yeah. My uh, you know, everything's there that I need. I could possibly. Right. Yep. Yeah. If you if your flashlight, if you can find your flashlight in the bed of your truck, then you'll take that too. Right. Occasionally. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've been like sitting at the truck with Dan and he's like, he's like thumbing around in the back of the seat. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, I can't find my flashlight. <laughs> he's like, there's three of them in here somewhere. I know there is. Uh, but anyway, is there any time like you would recommend like not being mobile? Um, when you, when you go into an area and you see a deer, and uh, um, you have a close call with them, I think you, I'd go right back in there. But then again, I still would probably make, you know, move from the tree I was in. Yeah. Um, not being mobile. Uh, we just ran into that situation up in the UP, the migrating deer. Yeah. Uh, I think we actually discussed that in that first video um, that uh, on the migration trails, there's no reason to be mobile. You just set up over the trail and all the deer that are migrating go past her. Yeah. But that's a pretty rare occurrence anywhere. Right. 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 Yeah, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, that's ingrained in me that mobile I've been doing that since I was a kid and, uh, preaching it since I was a kid. Yeah. So. In Ohio this year, I, uh, that was my first time. I think I sat in a tree more than, uh, you know, once, and I was in that, you know, I kind of found a little rut funnel whenever I was hunting and I saw a big buck that first sit and um, almost killed him. And I, I just had to sit there a couple more times because I just, when it's the rut and I, there was probably a hot doe because I saw like four bucks that night. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wasn't convinced that he was out of Dodge just yet. So, you know, mobile in the morning is kind of tough unless you have an area yeah. pre-scouted. Yeah. And pre-scouting is a good thing for mobile. I mean, you can walk through an area. That doesn't do the damage of hunting if you do it in spring once. I mean, yeah, right. dead hunters get everywhere, you know. Yeah, as right. As you don't spend a million hours in the area, you know. But uh, I lost my train of thought here. It's all right. It happens to me more than yeah, you would think sitting here. <laughs> um, something else is like, uh, turkey hunters go everywhere too. I mean, a lot of people go places turkey hunting that you wouldn't think think of too. Um, you don't have to really worry about hauling a deer out turkey hunting. At least here in the hills in Indiana, people people get in pretty. You know, if there's a turkey goblin way out in the hills, there's a decent chance someone will go that far turkey hunt. I know what um, I was going to say. I was going to say that uh, when you go into a spot in the evening, it's a good spot, and you're on a, on a trip or you're hunting mobile in an area. Yeah. A lot of times that uh, um, I'll just go back to that same spot in the morning. Now that I know that that's set up and it's a sp good spot, and there's a good chance the next morning that deer still hasn't come through there yet. Yeah. You know, as long as you don't wait a week or something for them to come through and smell you've been there the right, very next right. morning. Because I usually don't have very good morning spots that you just go in and hunt mobile mm -hmm. because you you go in there in the dark, you really can't see the limbs and stuff. And um, gray light, a lot of times you're doing more damage than you're doing good because you're chasing the deer out of an area. Yeah, I would go in gray light before I'd go in and. I would too. Just saying yeah. that. Right, it's still not ideal. No. Right. Yeah. So that's I mean, what I mean, if I find a good evening spot, nothing happens, but I still think it was a good spot. I might go right back there in the morning. Yeah, that's what that's what I was doing in Ohio. I just was finding the spots I felt like were, you know, good spots, and I just hunted them again in the morning because I knew I was in the right Especially spot. What spots yeah. usually? Right. And they're more funnelish, and they're yeah. not as much of uh, where they come in one way, go out another way, but they're more funnelish. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That is tough, though. I mean, I'm always like, I'm, when I'm on hunting trips, I'm always, I always want to be in the woods, you know. But mm -hmm. it's just the morning just suck. I just, yeah. I just found myself uh, on a lot of trips where I really haven't pre-scouted 
I find it a yeah. lot better to just spend my morning scouting and getting onto something for the evening. And then I have great evening hunts. And then yeah. along the way, if I see something that looks halfway decent that, I, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's a good spot. I might still give it a try in the morning, even though I walk there just because I've only been in there once. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Have you had much luck? Uh, like you, you set up midday very, very often at all. Not too often. Yeah, I haven't either. I mean, some people swear by midday movement sometimes. Depends on where you're at. I mean, around me, I don't see much movement in midday. Period. Yeah. You know, occasionally you do. Um, but just coming back from the UP, those deer move all day long. Really? Oh, yeah. All day. And they have to. Because if you think about it, at this time of winter, you know, up there and, and all that snow and stuff, they um, they have very little food. But they're all healthy looking deer well how do they get healthy looking they got to feed all day and night mm. they're just spot bedding and stuff and i think they move more in day to get away from wolves and stuff you know yeah but they're just constantly feeding when they're just nipping the ends off of little buds off of plants and stuff and that's all they have or they're eating cedar leaves and stuff they got to feed a lot so they're eating all day long you know we're down here they got a lot of food and they can just pile eat and then uh bed down and you know yeah. Something else I wanted to mention as far as like mobile hunting is I know we got some people that listen that are just like private land hunters and that's, it's just as important on private land to be, to be mobile. Mm -hmm. um, you can, and, and mobile, you know, we obviously we, me and Dan use the beast stand and sticks, but like you can, you can, if you have enough preset locations, you can be pretty mobile on a piece of private um, as long as you have enough spots picked out or, or, well, or, you, you know, think about Dave's farm. I mean, I got a bunch of uh, permanent setups there because, yeah. uh, you know, you got certain areas that if a deer comes through here, it's got to go through this certain area. And it's like, well, why not have a stand there, right? Yeah. Why go in there and make noise? And there's certain areas where I got to get really close to bedding. Why not just put a stand there and just leave it? You know, and then, you know, there's some spots where you might need <clears> multiple <throat> spots. Yeah. But on a, you put the stand in the best spot and maybe you don't put one over here. You can go and mobile to that spot. But I got stands all over there that are permanent, but they're usually not the spots where we kill the big bucks. Right. Because, you know, when we go in there in winter and scout, I'll kick up a, a, a giant buck's track, you know, just wandering through the farm. You go into the bedding areas, you see where he bedded. Sometimes you pick up a shed there and you follow his track out from the shed in the snow. But you, you follow these big buck tracks through that farm and watch how they get through that farm and never go by one of your permanent stands. Right. When there's permanent stands all over that 70 acres, you know it's not a coincidence that they don't go by them. So our permanent stands, we try to never hunt more than three times in a year. There's a couple we do, but they're more of observation stands than permanent stands. Or yeah. Maybe you can kill one out of it, but it's a good spot to get a starting point. Mm -hmm. But generally, when I kill a really big buck over there, it's because you're sitting in one of those observation stands or sitting in a permanent stand, and you watch that buck do something, and the next day you make a move on it. Yeah. I uh thinking about this topic earlier. I was thinking, like, I know so many, like, private landowners uh, around this area that just struggle to kill a buck with their bow on their private farms. And they'll end up shooting one with a rifle at like 300 yards on there, you know, but they'll right. like, I'll get people like call me around, you know, just buddies and whatnot talking to them. man. I saw, I saw the 150 or whatever the buck is, you know, and he just 80 yards, just ne never came close enough. And then I'm just like, you know, I've seen him four times now. And I'm like, yep. You know, I was like, just I've, had, I've had people tell me, you know, like, I seen the same buck. He just keeps coming out over here. Yeah. You know, 50 yards for me, just out of range. I'm just waiting for him to come over to this food plot. And you're like, well, why don't you move? And they look at you like you're stupid. Like, yeah. well, I don't want to spook him out of the area. Well, yeah. do you, you want to kill him? You know, he's not coming over there because you're hunting there. Right. You know, you can wait till gun season, but you could probably move over with a bow and, and kill him now. And gun season is probably not going to be there anymore. Right. Um, for like preset stands, do you think like having a lock on versus a ladder stand really matters for, for deer? I do not. I don't think it matters. I think what matters is you don't make noise. I think the big thing about a ladder stand is you're not getting an exact height out of it. 
Yeah. Where with a lock on, on a permanent stand, you can take that stand and you can put it at the exact position where you have cover, exact position where you got shooting over stuff. Um, with a ladder stand, you kind of get set at a particular height in a tree and it might not be where you have the best position to put that ladder stand. Right. Now, some people are probably looking at this going, what's he talking about? You know, well, they're, maybe they're hunting a straight forest in the woods. I rarely ever hunt in solid forested areas. I mean, sometimes in hill country where you're hunting elevations, but uh, most of the time I'm on edge. I'm on the edge of thick cover. And there is, you know, the trees are limmy. You have to have shooting lanes. You have to have a position to put that. So if you put a ladder stand up, you're kind of locked in that height. You know, where when I go in with a, with a tree stand, let's just say I'm going in mobile. I'm looking at that tree. I'm looking for where do I have cover? Where do I have back limbs to blend me into? Where do I have shooting? Where You know, at what point do I got to be? I don't want to be down the tree where I'm sitting in, the, in wide open. I want to be up in the limbs, but I don't want to be way up in the limbs where I got no, you know. So every tree, I'm at a different height. You know what I'm saying? Well, with the ladder stands, you don't have that. Right. right. You have a set height you have to be at. I think if you're going to use ladder stands, like you almost have to go in and kind of pre-scout where you're going to put things and decide if you can, you know, or how, you know, how high up your ladders are, if they're 16 or 20 feet or whatever the, the uh, height is of them. Yeah. You know, you know, I've done uh, scouted people's properties for them where they older people where they've asked me to use all ladder stands to set up for them. Yeah. And, uh, the reason is that they're, they just can't climb a regular tree stand no more. I mean, they're, Right. In their seventies or eighties and they just can't do it, but they can get up a ladder stand. And uh I get that, but it sure certainly isn't a benefit. No. It's it's that they have to. It's all they right. have, you know, or they can't hunt, you know, or they gotta go back to ground hunting, you know. Mm -hmm. I listened to uh uh Barry Wenzel do a seminar a few years back, and he's an older gentleman now, you know, um, that's killed a whole bunch of bucks. And uh, they actually take old, uh, they go to like dollar, dollar stores or wherever after Christmas and buy all the old Christmas trees and um, gar garland or whatever that stuff's called. And they'll actually like decorate around their ladder stands and stuff to create cover on their, mm -hmm. their stands. Because, you know, those guys, I think they're in their 80s now, too. Um, yeah, and they got permanent land. They just leave it like that. So, the deer yeah, deer. yeah, it's just a probably like a you know, limbs for the deer now. I, I wonder how many deer a guy like that sees that are just out of range that know that that stands there because all the, yeah, there. I don't know. They're in Iowa too, but yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, you know, I know uh, uh, there's guys that kill big bucks year after year on, on managed property just because they, they never shoot anything little and nobody else shoots anything little. And I mean, it's a large, massive land locked up and stupid lives and stupid survives till it gets old. But there's still some animals that get really big that even on private land aren't stupid. No, right. You know, um, I've often, you know, heard some of the celebrity type hunters say that they got some giant on their property that they're, they nobody ever kills. And they've been after and after and after and they got trail cam pics of. And I think a lot in a lot of cases, that's the reason is because that thing knows where all your stands are. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, anyway. I, uh, I've been doing it for a long time now and it's, it's whenever I teach new people how to deer hunt, that's the first thing I tell them is that like, you got to learn how to hunt mobile before you learn how to shoot your bow good before you learn all this stuff, you know, you're like, this is the, this is the key to success right here. Yeah. I have a friend, I have a friend that's been, he's been hunting on and off for a long time, but he's, he's always been like your typical, not typical, but just like a, a guy that would hunt a couple times a year. He would go set in some uh, tripod stand that on the edge of a field and, you know, very rarely would shoot a deer. And I convinced him this year to, to buy a mobile setup and he killed three deer this year. And he's like, he goes, dude, I've seen more deer since I've started hunting mobile than I had the last five years total. Uh, and he just was amazed. I mean, he shot like a 140 inch nine pointer or whatever mm -hmm. it was. I think it was a nine pointer. Uh, and it's like, it, 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 if, if you're not hunting mobile, it'll like change your, the way you, um, look at hunting almost. Um, and it's just more exciting. Like whenever you're in a new spot and, you know, I don't ever set up another aspect of mobile hunting is like, um, 
your confidence levels seem to go up to me. Mm-hmm. Like I don't typically set up unless I'm on hot sign or right. um, any of that kind of stuff. So whenever I'm sitting there, I'm like almost on pins and needles the whole sit, just like it's going to happen tonight because of these reasons. Um, and you don't get that whenever you just go set the same four or five stands every. Well, wait, every if sit. you um, if you hunt rotating through stands, I mean, there's guys that'll put five stands out. There's guys that'll put ten out. Mm-hmm. Maybe them and a partner rotate through them based on the wind and stuff. They'll be like hunt stand the 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 drop tine stand, hunt the the food plot stand, yeah, hunt yeah. you know based on the wind, right? And they just rotate through those stands, even if that was successful, which occasionally it is, and you know. Even if that was highly successful, um, are you learning anything? Or are you just yeah, rotating yeah. through the same stance? Are you Good are point. you um, hunting deer or are you hunting a stand? I'm out there playing a chess match with these deer. I'm figuring them out. I'm looking at a giant forest, a swamp of 2,000 acres, and I'm saying, okay, I heard about this buck in here, or I've seen this buck in here, or I got a trail cam pick of this buck. Where do I believe he's betting? How do I believe he's moving? Where do I think he's going? How do I think he's coming out? And I go and I hunt that deer down. And when you kill a deer, because you guessed where he was going to be bet on a certain day, based on the wind, based on the terrain, and you go and you set up in the only tree that you could possibly kill him out of in daylight, and you watch that deer get out of the bed that you thought he'd be in, just based on using your brain, and he comes in and you kill him, uh, even if it's a a, a 120-incher, it might as well as be the biggest boon and crockett in the world because yeah. the amount of pride you get out of doing that. And, and it's, it might sound funny to some of the people watching this, but until you've done it, um, don't knock it. You know, when you go out there and you put it all together and it happens on the exact animal you want out of the exact tree, you think he's going to go by something special. Yeah. And it's addicting. I mean, I, I don't want to do it any other way. I mean, yep. Matter of fact, I mean, up in Michigan now, we're we're seeing deer bedded and stuff where we could probably sneak up on them in that heavy snow and just kill them. Yeah, I didn't want to do it. That's not. I don't want to do that. Yeah, it doesn't sound fun to me. Where to some people that's their thing. My thing is that chess game. You know, it's that outsmarting them kind of thing. Whether I get something bigger, I don't. It's another story. But at least I'm in the game. I'm in the yeah. chase. You know. Yeah, and figuring out how to hunt mobile too. Like it opens up so much more opportunity for you. I mean. Um, you know, a lot of people are afraid to go on public because they don't really, I mean, they don't know how to use a mobile setup or, or, um, they're intimidated by it. And like, uh, so they just go hunt their private 20 acres, you know, and, and that's all they hunt because they don't, they don't know any different. Um, but if you can just figure out, you know, that, that type of hunting, it's like your, your, your options are unlimited. I mean, as long as you live in an area where there's public land, you know, Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, and it's key. It's a, in my opinion, it's a, uh, you know, I don't have an access to enough private land to uh, not burn it out for as much as I hunt, you know. So um, it's not really an option for me. I have to hunt mobily on all the public land around here I run around on. So, all right. We've been on here for almost an hour. You want to do some questions or do you have anything else to add to the mobile hunting? No, let's see what the questions are. All right, let's see here. Chris Brown, he asked, he has a 20 acres of hilly timber area with only one access point. He says, I get busted quite a bit because they can see me entry, see the entry from the next ridge. He said, did you have any any, uh, tips on sneaking in there? I'd probably um, um, wait for a very windy day. They can't see you very far on windy days because of uh, foliage moving around. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, uh, hunt more mornings so that they're not there watching you, getting there for the whole day. Yeah, that's a, that's a good tip. I don't know if a guy could go in there like this winter and try to make some path or something somewhere where you could be a little more hidden going in. I, that's that's rough whenever you only have that, that 20 acres isn't very big. Um, if there's, if they got a vantage point, it's, it's tough. Try parking down the road. Maybe there's, you know, hearing you close your doors and stuff. Um, going in really early helps too. Um, I think deer are kind of lethargic in midday. Mm-hmm. 
And if you just walk through and you, you don't try sneaking, they don't like sneaking. They, they know you're sneaking when you sneak. If you just walk in there like you own the place and then get around to where they can't see you and set up and uh, amount of time goes by, they kind of forget about you. Yeah. Yep. It is crazy how whenever you, uh, when a deer sees you from a ways off, if you just keep walking real fast, like they almost don't even, they just sit there and watch you, you know, whereas if you I've start. Very, like, I've, I've had big bucks. You walk by and you, out of your peripheral, you see them bedded, you know, 20 yards from you. Yeah. And if you don't stop and make eye contact, they just lay there and let you pass. Oh, yeah. And that's not every deer. Someone no. will jump up when you're 100 yards away and take off, you know, yeah. depending on uh, what life lessons they have learned over their time. Some of them have learned that just hunkering down is better for them, and some of them have learned that uh, getting out of Dodge is a good idea. But um, um, there are a lot of deer that will just let you just walk past. And I've actually had some deer where I've walked past them at a few yards. Yeah. And I, I think probably everybody listening to this, if you're an avid hunter, is at one time or another been walking through the woods, stopped. And all of a sudden, a buck jumps up right beside him and takes yeah. off. Well, if you weren't stopped, you wouldn't have took off. Yep. Happen, happened to me this year. Um, Hunter has a question for you, Dan. He says, is there a chance of designing a 300-pound hunting beast stand for us big guys? Yeah, there's a chance of that. I, I was... Uh, Working on that, it's just a slow ride. You got a lot of stuff going. Would you mind like explaining to people like what that testing entails? Like what how how people get those ratings or what you had well, to pass to um, have a three hundred pound stand? Well, uh you have to have uh six hundred pounds of static weight on the platform to have a uh in a ten by ten square um position right between the cables in order for it to uh pass for 300 pounds so they literally they'll put weight on until it destroys and it's got to be more than 600 pounds right so that's how i test them and that's how basically they test them in the independent testing places and then uh the seat has to be time and a half so it would be uh the seat has to hold 450 pounds that's why you never want to stand on a seat yeah because seats aren't rated for standing on them yeah. But uh, they're not rated to the same weight as the, the platform. Um, so, uh, you, you, you know, if you test it correctly, you'll uh, uh, they don't do this in all testing facilities, but we do it. Uh, we put side weight on it. We put weight in different positions on it where they don't actually do that in regular testing facilities. But uh, I do. I do when I test them. I just want to make sure that there uh, there isn't a weak point or something. But Right. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Does this tree stand companies are, are you required to do those testing or is that just like a absolutely not? Mm -mm. Okay, you're not required to, but if you get um, if you want to be TMA certified, you, you need that. But in, in my idea, uh, TMA means the tree stand mafia association. <laughs> um, and the reason I say that is because what it is basically they they take the leaders in the uh, tree stand industry. And, and what what the leaders are is anybody willing to pay the money to be a member and you want yeah. to be a member because then they hold you in high standing and they tell everybody you got great tree stands but literally you're the one making the rules mm -hmm. so you got tree stand manufacturers making the rules and what i notice is a lot of them you, you know like uh my competitors will pay to be in there and then they'll make rules so that uh for me to get certified um a long stick won't work because they don't have a long stick so they don't want mine to be in there so they just make a rule like that because they're all tree stand manufacturers. The Tree Stand mm -hmm. Manufacturers Association is really a group of uh, Italian mobsters that uh, have decided that they can use that uh, to stop other people from manufacturing tree stands. I don't think it's got a lot to do with safety anymore. Really? I shouldn't say all that because they're going to get mad at me, but it's true. Yeah. When, when they have meetings and they have guys in the meetings from the different groups that paid their way in, so that they'd have a say. It's pretty weird. Maybe it's to stop people from designing things in a certain way. Yeah, Tree Stand Mafia Association. You but, think they should just like but, have like, go ahead, sorry. The but is um, without them, we'd be, we'd be a lot more dangerous in this industry. Yeah. So there are some basic rules in there like the testing uh, weight wise and the static weight and stuff, but I don't even think they test good enough. I think they should be putting 
they, they should be doing it in different ways. Like, like I kind of do when I'm making stuff, but anywho, um, it is safer because of the, the, it has gone through that, that testing. testing. Yeah. Sorry to get y'all fired up about that. I'm not fired up. I just don't. <laughs> it just is what it is, right? I mean, I'm, I'm opinionated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So what ask if we are done hunting. What about you, Dan? Hunting never ends. Right. It's I'm like, not either. It's like when, uh, when I got my butt kicked it when I was a kid. And, and uh, I told my old man, it, it's over. I'm, I'm done with this. And he says, it's never over. Finish it. <laughs> <laughs> it's never over. Hunting is never, ever, ever over. Nope. However, actually, the killing part of it, uh, for me, um, will probably end January 31st unless I actually kill one. Yeah. Shut up. Um, it's got to be the right animal. But... Um. We'll see. I'm still hunting. Yep. I'm be hunting until January 31st. Yep. I'm going to go to Illinois here in the next coming week. So I'll be, I'll be hunting in Illinois. I actually got a message today. Uh, Clay Hayes is organizing uh, for me and Maddie and Huck to come up to his house, down to his house in Florida and go pig hunting mm. in Mar the end of March 1st, end of February 1st of March. So, um, I'll go do that. That's not deer hunting though. I don't, we don't, he doesn't think any deer seasons are in down there, but uh, that's why I messaged you today about our seminars, what weekends they were. Mm. Was trying to, yeah. He was, he was, um, telling us. Yeah, I was going to say before you said that is that uh, if deer hunting closed, I would be hunting something. I'd probably go on a pig hunt or something. Or, yeah. Or go down and hunt one of the um, states that has rut in uh, January, you know? Yeah. Um, go do something. Yeah, there's always something to do. Mm -hmm. We have, I could be hunting here still. We got deer induction zones and stuff that goes until February. Um, all right. This is a good question that we don't talk about very much. Robert asked if we do all day sits. I don't do very many of them every now and then, but not very often. Yeah, I don't either. I, mean, I just have prime hours and uh, I find the scouting is more important than the actual killing. I, or hunting, I should say, because uh, the scouting is what puts me on the animal I'm after. So if I'm hunting an animal down, I have to go find the next position to hunt them. Yeah. Because I'm I, hunting mobile, right? Right, right. I haven't I haven't done an all-day sit. I can't remember the last time I did it. Um, Even when I did them, I mean, I never saw mature animals in, in midday. I mean, not in my area. Hmm. Yeah, I've, ne I've never killed one in the middle of the day either. Uh, all right. Veteran outdoorsman asked if we've ever used a ghost blind. I think that's that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's that blind that's like a mirror. Yeah, I, I've never used one. Um, yeah, I have never used one either. It's kind of a neat idea, but we've got uh, blinds from Tide Wee that are, uh, you can see th not, it's not 360. I think they say 360, but it's not because one side you can't see through. But the whole rest of it, you can see out of. Yeah. You haven't got yours yet because you're just sitting over here. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, it's pretty cool. You're sitting there and you can see everything with the, you know, I just have my little opening. Yeah. That's there. pretty cool. I'm going to use it turkey hunting this year. I'm going to set it out somewhere for, for when buddies and stuff come and hunt with me. I got mine sitting in the backyard uh, by the food plot. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'll have somebody sit down there and shoot a doe or something. Or yeah. maybe I will. I don't know. That'd be pretty cool. I've never set in a blind that's 360. I'm anxious to get in there and see what it looks like in there. Um, Dustin, thanks for the donation. I don't think you you don't you didn't really ask a question, but we appreciate it. If you got a question, feel free to ask. Um, let's see here. He uh, the true hunter. He asked if we ever gave up a spot because of pressure. All the I time. Have, yep. All quite time. often. Quite often. It's I can think of way, man. It's public land. Anybody can hunt wherever they want. And uh um quite often uh my best spots, one day you go in there and there's a camera there, a tree stand and a trail cut to it. And spot's pretty much ruined anyway, so why would I keep hunting there? 
Um, but occasionally somebody will get in for one or two hunts. But usually I hunt a spot once a year or at most twice a year. And it's not even very many spots I hunt twice a year. Maybe a couple spots on the on Dave's farm that I hunt more than once. But usually public land, I am in a different spot every time I go out. Even though there's spots I, I have scouted, I know um, from previous years or whatever, or from scouting. But somebody gets in there and uh, I usually just take the high road and move on. It's not my land. It's everybody's land. Yeah. And I think if you don't have that attitude, it can be a rough go at it on public land. You know, if you let that stuff get to you. You, you know, that destroys a lot of people um, that are YouTubers or, or well-known hunters. Um, um, I can think of somebody in my group who quit because of it. But yeah, you get uh, you start putting up films and people start actually watching your videos and trying to figure out where you hunted and they a lot of times they figure it out and they get in your spots and they your spot is no longer your spot you know um where i shot that real big buck uh last year um the fifth day of the season there's a line of people hunting there now there's never anybody there before you know um yeah. I, I could just name spot after spot after spot that that's happened to and yeah. i just move on and I could kill bucks in those spots year after year just by keeping my mouth shut and not posting videos. So a lot of guys in the in the video industry will just uh, stop posting videos. You know, right. they just they get out of it because it frustrates them or whatever. But um, I'm really um, to a point where killing a giant buck is uh, is what I'm trying to do. But it's not really life or death. I don't care if I get one or I don't. It's more about the hunt. It's about the process. Yeah. And uh, I've got a wall full of deer and uh, I really enjoy bringing people into the sport. And I think the, um, the good people that watch the videos that are learning something and that are carrying on the tradition and that are staying into hunting because of what they learned here, far outnumber the few crazies. And when you get to the point where you got 70,000 followers, you're going to have a few whack jobs, like it or not. Yeah. You, uh, I don't, I don't think you care me mentioning this, but <laughs> didn't someone find your arrow you shot that buck with last year and like bring it to your house or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that spot. Um, I hunted there. I uh, found that bedding. I mean, I showed it on video. I found the bedding. I, I realized it's got to be that big buck. I realized it had to be in September. I, there was only one possible tree you could get in, and it was a bush, mm -hmm. and it was an invasive species book bush buckthorn so you can cut limbs i had to cut a hole to shoot out of that i literally had to cut a hole to put the stand on and to shoot out of it because it's just, just a bush and i had a shooting lane in two directions that tree had never ever ever been hunted out of before um when i shot that buck i got a message from a local kid who said that he'd been hunting that spot for years and that's a great spot and he, i'll probably see him there sometime and uh, then he sent me a message and said uh, that he went back there. It had bothered him that I didn't find my arrow. So he found it for me. And I had shot into, I mean, some crazy brush and cattails. Yeah. I shot through that deer. And I looked and looked and we couldn't find that arrow. That kid literally had to dig up all the grass to find that arrow. And he set it on my uh, mailbox. I mean, it is what yeah. it is. He's probably listening now. Yeah. If you are, thanks for returning the arrow, man. Uh, here's a question. That's everybody else that's hunting that spot now, too. Yeah. How did the Raptor Mini platform come about, and whose idea was that? You guys the Raptor platform. Mini platform? The one that goes on the top of the sticks? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was 100% uh, uh, Mario's idea. Um, yeah. Dan probably doesn't even know what it's called. <laughs> I in that a long time ago, like right when the stand came out. Yeah. And uh, um, he took so much time designing it that other people came up with similar things. But um, he literally had, and who knows, they might have been designing it when we were designing ours because it was the, the uh, logical direction to go. Um, but uh, that was totally Mario's idea. I'm not big into uh, uh, saddle hunting, um, right. obviously. Um but I do have some ideas for a saddle platform that I think will be revolutionary. I just got to get to it. Yeah. Just, uh, yep. 
Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Um, before we get to this question, some people were asking about the weight limit on the B stand. It's 275 still, right, Dan? Yeah, it actually uh, passed all the um, ratings for 300. Um, but uh, at the time, we decided that uh, we didn't want to push um, 300 pound men being that high in a tree in a small platform. Yeah. Um, we might have that, um, we might redo it. I don't know if we will or not. Um, just because all our competitors are breaking that there's a 300 and ours not, but ours actually does rate for 300. We just could, put 275 on it. Yeah. You could legally put 300 on the marketing stuff then just didn't. Um, anyway. All right. Someone asks, <clears throat> what started our mobile hunting pressure or big bucks? Pressure or big bucks. He's asking like, what, what, what made us start hunting mobile? Um, just getting, getting more action, getting more bucks, uh, more deer period, um, getting on them, uh, moving to the deer instead of letting them come to me. Um, I always, uh, had a lot more success hunting in that manner. And literally, um, actually neither of his answers are the right ones because literally I grew up without mentors. So I went out hunting and I put stands up and out of two by fours. And, you know, when I was a, a kid, not even a teenager really. And, uh, just went out and just chased deer around with a bow on the ground and stuff. Cause I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have nobody teaching me how to hunt and times were different back then. It wasn't like everybody was hunting and everybody's telling you how to hunt and stuff. I mean, old timers would tell you to sit on a chair and smoke a cigarette and uh, right. be quiet and sit in the same spot all the time. You, you know, there wasn't really a lot of logic in hunting. So I just went out on my own. My dad didn't hunt. My brothers were off in Vietnam. And I just went out hunting. And I learned real quick that if you sat over by food and stuff, you'd watch these deer come out of what looked like bedding and it would take them forever to get to you. So the logical step was to move closer. And uh, the closer I got, the better my hunts were. And then uh, when big deer started showing up where I was hunting, which really was outside the norm, because back in those days, there's so much pressure and so many people killed deer to survive and to live off of, that deer didn't really grow big. Mm -hmm. So when big deer showed up in my area, I started learning, after learning that I had to be close to bedding, I started studying the bedding and spring scouting, winter scouting, something that nobody did back in those days, you know, and... I learned where they bedded and how they bedded and then went back and went after them in those spots. And when I saw how well that paid off, that just transformed the way I hunt. That's really, um, I've been doing this from almost day one. You know, I mean, I started in a couple two by four stands and stuff, but you started learning really quick to move to the deer because I didn't have anybody teaching me bad habits basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just did what naturally came to you, like what made sense, probably. Right. You know? I, I really believe that if other people didn't have their father, their uncle, their, you know, their neighbors and everybody else mentoring them in a certain direction, I would think most people would end up doing that because it just makes common sense. I mean, you, mm -hmm. where do the deer come from? Where, do, where are they in daylight? Where are deer when it's light out? And what time do you shoot them? You shoot them when it's light out. Mm -hmm. Right. They're animals. Yep. Someone on here said that they uh, are friends with a guy that works at Hunter Safety System. They'll ask about zippered pockets for us. Cool. There you go. <laughs> uh, Tyler Welch asked, he has a 200 plus acre swamp with dogwood, cattails, and tamaracks. He says, tons of deer tracks, heavy trails, and droppings, but very few rubs or other buck signs. He said, how do you go about hunting it the first season? Uh, I'm probably going to say that you're going to be able to see tracks. Um, there has to be some rubs somewhere of big rubs or there is no big bucks. Um, they all bucks rub. So the other thing is, is that, uh, a lot of those marshes and swamps, especially if they got a lot of dogwood and cattail and stuff, sometimes they hold more deer later in the season and they kind of migrate there either for food or shelter or to get away from pressure. And at that point, they're no longer rubbing. You know, they're rubbing during rut. Um, but if they are in there and you don't have a lot of sign, which could be the case. I mean, uh, if you got a high doe density, a lot of times they don't rub a lot. 
-hmm. But if you uh, you go in there and you find the points, you, you you find the islands, you find the stuff that we always talk about the the um, the bedding features that are in that type of terrain, and you just hunt that area down, and you'll get on bucks like crazy. So uh, a uh, swamp like he's saying, it's got tamaracks, cattails, and dogwood. There's going to be islands of tamaracks. There's going to be points in those islands that come off that are brushy, that have bedding on them. There's going to be in the, the uh, dogwood. There's going to be where dogwood meets cattails. There's going to be little points. Where those points are, there's going to be bedding. The trails that come out of that bedding are going to go to a tree eventually, and that's where you're going to hunt. You know, um, it's just the basics. The, the transition edge of cattails meets dogwood, of cattails meet tamarack, of dogwood meets tamarack, of tamarack meets forest. Those transition yeah. edges are where the deer are going to be. There you go. Um, Aaron asks, will orange marking tape and light-up tags make you lose interest in an area, or would you still scout and check for sign, et cetera? Um, I tend to, to avoid places where other people are actively hunting. If it looks like they're being, it's actively hunted, I'm not there. If it looks like it's just gun season and I'm a ways out of gun season, whether it's late or early, I might give it a try, but probably not. Usually if I'm hunting mature bucks, they're not where other people hunt. Yeah. And as soon as I'm not finding hunter sign, I'm, I'm finding the bucks I'm after. Um, I know it's, I know it's said over and over again, but they're the majority of the mature bucks I shoot are in spots where nobody goes. You take a look at the forest and you say, okay, 10% of this is where nobody goes. Mark off the other 90% where you think people go. And that 10% where you think nobody goes, find deer terrain in there. Mm -hmm. And that's where your big bucks are going to be. I would tell you with that, those markings you're talking about, um, I don't get discouraged with that stuff until I've scouted the place out. Because like some areas... If you don't hunt a public, you're not going to, if you don't want to hunt a piece of public that doesn't have an orange marker, you're not going to hunt anywhere. You know, um, that's stuff people use. And sometimes it's you just got to. by you because it's uh, hill country. I yeah. mean, people do get into most of that stuff, but I still look for the overlooked stuff. Yeah. That's what I meant. I it's like, stuff yeah. Just because you like walk out of the parking lot and find a tack in the tree, I, you know, that doesn't mean you shouldn't go and and hunt that area. Well, I, I was thinking you were saying that you should hunt, you could, you hunt most spots that have tax and flags right where you hunt. No, no. I just meant like, don't, don't get out of your truck and walk into the woods and see a flag and be like, ah, screw this. Well, that, you know? another, it, it drives me nuts when people say if there's a car in a parking lot, they go past. I mean, you're talking about a place that's like hundreds of acres. Yeah. Or thousands. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one yeah. guy is not discouraging me. Yeah. I'm sometimes bad about that, but it may be a product of where I'm from too, because we don't have as many hunters mm -hmm. as you guys do. Cause I, I had to get to, I got, I learned pretty quick the first time I went to Wisconsin and hunted. Uh, yeah. Well you go, you get rut where I'm at and every yeah. park, uh, 10 cars. In it. Yeah. Uh, Gary, I went up there well, and hunted with him. Here and there is gun season. Yeah. I went up there and hunted with him during rut at his house a few years back. And the first day I'm like, Oh, there's someone parked there. He's like, okay. Oh. He's like, he's, he's like, you gotta go. Is he, there's gonna be someone parked everywhere, dude. I'm like, all right. So, uh, I get that. Zeke asks if anybody uses a drone for scouting. Zeke, that's all illegal in a lot of states. So, um, yeah, I think, I think we can use it to look, but it can't be used, um, for hunting. I don't know exactly. I'd have to read the exact law. I don't yeah. use one. Um, yeah. I have one. I, I can't even drive it. I yeah, think it's off the ground and I crash. Yeah, I have one that I use for filming, but I've never never scouted with it. I t I, I use one. Uh, I it was after I shot that doe. I I used it, but I uh, I where I shot my doe the other a uh, few weeks ago. Um, they they came out there whatever a few nights later. I took my drone and flew over, and you could see the deer out in the field again. It was kind of a cool shot, but I wasn't really for scouting. I just was want to get a cool shot of the, the deer out there yeah, literally uh you could you could fly those over bedding areas here in the cattails and you could see every deer in them and it, and it would be very yeah. unfair yeah i'm sure yeah, people I, are doing it yeah i think it's illegal in 
an awful lot of states. It's illegal here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know there's some really high tech ones farmers use to like uh, look at crop damage and stuff like that. Um, it's getting popular. Also, deer recovery. Um, I guess they got like infrared ones that can pick up, uh, you know, warm areas where deer's laying or whatever. So that's a good idea. I mean, that's I don't see like I don't feel like that's hurting anything to go try to find your your buck with a drone, but it's also illegal in most states. Um, is there a scenario where you guys would spot and stalk a buck? The conditions have to be perfect. I've, I've snuck up on one whitetail and killed it in uh, its bed, but it was that deer right there. But mm-hmm. it was raining, it was windy, nasty, and he couldn't hear me moving or, you know, um, couldn't hear me sneaking in. That's the only time I've ever felt like I could get close enough to one with a bow and arrow and kill it. Yeah, I've I've uh, I've gotten a couple kind of like that, but uh, it's really not my forte. Yeah, it's not. I, your I big, mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't your biggest good. one, your biggest one, you shot with a gun, didn't you? In its bed, sneaking up yeah. on it. Yeah, I crawled up to its bed with a shotgun. And you, you know what the funny part about that is? Is uh, I, I, you know, never dreamed I could possibly do that with a bow. But I crawled the twenty yards, stood up, and shot it with the shotgun while it sat yeah. in its bed. So if it was a bow, it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. Which um, you, you know teaches you a lesson, and you learn you could do that. I, I guess you know, um, in that manner, if I knew where he was bedded, and I, you, you know, it was a planned thing. But just to randomly kill one, I just there's something about it that I don't know. I would, I wouldn't have no problem with it. If I was on a road trip or something, I'd probably go do it, but. I just, yeah. uh, it's not something I want to do. Let's put it like that. I'm, I might do it just because I can or something, but I don't know if I'd feel great about it. Right. It's just me. I mean, I'm not knocking that for anybody else. So nobody take this as I'm putting that down. Yeah. It's I my it. style and what I like. <laughs> right. It's what I, yeah. it's what I like. I, about it. I like the, I like the, uh, the thing that keeps me going out every day is the challenge of the chess game. Yeah, the playing one on one with a big buck and, and hunting them down. I, you know, to some degree, I don't even take that much pride in just shooting a random buck that you didn't know was out there. Not saying I wouldn't, right? But I like hunting down a certain animal, and it's just it's fun to do. Yeah, know? yeah, you're pretty you're pretty uh, realistic hunter in my mind. Like you're pretty um, um, you're an oper- you know opportun- opportunity when it arises you you capitalize on it because you're you know that it doesn't happen every every right. week you know mm-hmm. um so a lot of people are asking us what type of permanent tree stands we use and i don't i don't i'm not knowledgeable enough on like to give you a suggestion on stuff like that um i just buy the ones on sale somewhere whenever i need a, a permanent one I do a lot of things to like, I still like stealth strip some of mine up and um, I'll paint them if they're like, if I think there's areas that are going to rust and because yeah. I've heard, I have heard of people buying them cheap ladders that go up the side of a tree, you know, like 20 foot ladders. I've heard of those breaking off, like the steps breaking off. So I always like put some like truck bed liner on some of those areas that yeah tend to steal cables too on stands over time can uh rust under the plastic and you don't see it and the cable snaps yeah that's happened um i i have to say that every time i buy a steel stand it's if, over time they start making noise and stuff especially if they're left on a tree forever and they start yeah growing into the tree and kind of twisting and stuff and you start getting creaks out of them and crap it's hard to keep them dang things quiet yeah they creak and pop and everything else especially the ladder stands they always seem to like settle and when you're climbing up and make a big popping noise when you're climbing, um, there there may be, maybe there's a brand that they got that stuff figured out, but I've never used one that doesn't. Um, there's some, I got a few, uh, like, like a half a dozen or or more lone wolf stands. I use those because the cast ones don't make much noise, but I don't know that everybody could afford to put those in every tree that they hunt out of permanently. Yeah. That's what, that's, I think there is some like really high end permanent set or setting stands, but it's just like, man, how do you, how do you justify spending $400 on a, uh, 
a setup that's you know you have to have i usually don't take my uh permanent stands too seriously so they're usually pretty cheap stands to be honest yeah you know i take it seriously i put one of the lone wolves out there yeah and i just try um, not to, to step in a whale creek it yeah i use my mobile stand a lot in permanent setups too like, I've, like uh, I said, I hunt over and over again i might just use the mobile one but yeah. i don't hunt any spots over and over again just on dave's farm mostly right um me and dad talk, I had thought about that just putting up a ladder like a one of those ladders on the side of the tree and then just carrying in the stand it's just a pain in the butt because then you gotta i gotta detach my sticks and i don't know you know um i always have my stand put together and just have to take it all apart and put it back together I'm like I might as well just bring the sticks in with me then i can say there's been a time or two where i get really close to betting on, on dave's in a spot where i could have a permanent where i get busted going up the tree yeah you know, when you're 50 60 yards from betting yeah yeah where if i had a permanent stand i think i could slip up there a little easier without getting busted yeah uh deer hunting cajuns asked uh he says i hunt a spot near a big buck bed the no suitable trees he said would you should i sit up set up a tent on first time in or just camo out and sit on the on a chair or on the ground i wouldn't do either what would you do? I, would, I would probably hunt the ground, but I'd probably try to use some sort of natural blind. I think anything yeah. you do that uh, changes the landscape is going to be noticed immediately. If you uh, walked into your kitchen tomorrow from work, you unlocked your door, walked in, and you're the only one that's supposed to be in the house, and uh, there was a tent in your kitchen on your floor, <laughs> what would you think? Yeah. You know, um, or if there's bear tracks going across your kitchen floor. A deer is going to notice that that's his living room. If you're right next to his bedding area, he is going to notice slight things moved around. Or, or like when I go into those bedding areas and I make a setup, I go in and spring and scout. Very, very little setup. Very little. Even if I can, I don't want to trim much. You yeah. cut something yeah. out of there, they notice. You do something to alter something, they notice. Yeah. Um, I would say that the best thing you can do is look around for some natural piece of cover that you can get into blend into where you got a good backdrop something blocking half of your body in front of you something behind you that blends you in you look at it good you see what you need for color wise for a camo scheme you get in there and if you're on the ground make sure you got a face covering and yeah uh, that's yeah. what i would do yeah i would definitely not take a tent 50 yards from a buck bed. I mean, you're going to spook him. It would be impossible to pop that thing out and everything. I got a funny story about a tent. <clears throat> Whenever we were, uh, I was in high school, me and my cousin were turkey hunting. Um, I, we don't hardly ever use tents at all. And we had one out there and it got to raining real hard uh, that morning. There's a turkey goblin. And we, we took that tent and unstaked it inside and we walked that thing all the way up to where that turkey was gobbled and ended up shooting that turkey. It was like, I wish, I wish we'd have been videoing that so bad. Uh, we weren't videoing back then, but it was like, it was the funniest thing. We were like cracking ourselves up as we were like walking uh, with that tent over our head towards that turkey. And uh, it was, it was funny. That's the, that's the only time I think I've ever killed anything out of a, um, with a tent, but um you got any opinions on screw in steps for permanent tree stands, Dan? Uh kind of opinions. I mean, uh I think I think they, they work. Um I've used them. Um you do have to be a little careful which kinds you get. Uh some of the thin cheap ones will break in cold weather. Uh mm -hmm. I had one break um when I was about six feet off the ground once, um, when it was probably like fifteen below or something. And uh, uh, it caused uh, the breakage to have a very sharp point. And when it broke, my leg slammed down and it cut my leg open about, you know, six, eight inches long and uh, about a half inch deep. And I was bleeding pretty badly um, because that thing snapped off. Um, so you want to be careful about not using too cheap a one. Um, certain trees, uh, screw steps will pop out of. Um, I mean, you probably know that it happens with dead ones you know, the bark, bark shrouding yeah. or whatever, but uh, black walnut trees, if you leave them in them, there's something that'll happen, like some sort of chemical thing around the uh, threads. It'll turn like black and rot. 
and uh, you won't know it, but they're in there tight when you put them in there. And a month or two later, they're they're loose, and it'll just pop out when you step on them. So, um, I mean, they can work, and in some trees, they just grow in, they stay there, or whatever. Um, I used them when I when I first started out, um, getting real serious about mobile. Um, gosh, that's got to be in the um, 80s. Um, I had a steel stand all taped up and stuff, and I had uh, screw steps. I put electrical tape on the handles and all the way up to the threads. And uh, um, I would bungee them together, and I'd use those as a mobile ladder. like Because they didn't have sticks or anything else in those days. You know, screw steps were about it. That was, like, that was new in those days. So I would use those to climb a tree, you know, from for mobile setup. Um, and then unscrew them, but they do cause damage to trees and, um, uh, landowners will get mad about them. Um, they're usually illegal on most public lands. Um, if you're on private land, you devalue your trees with them. And if you leave them in a tree and they grow in and a logger, uh, you ever sell the logs on your land and a logger hits one of those with a chainsaw, he's going to be mad. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's very many States on, on public anymore that it's legal. I think maybe a Western state or two, it's still legal, but um, what time of year is your most successful to shoot a mature buck, not including the rut? I don't think either I one of us would say rut in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Was it for you, rut? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, or early season for sure. Like the first, if, the first three days of season, that's what I've got on some of the bigger mm -hmm. bucks I've, uh, I've hunted for sure. So I, I would kind of agree with that. I think uh, both late season and, you know, far late season in the north, not necessarily everywhere, but in the far north where I'm at, it gets cold enough that late season can be really good. But you're either in them or you're not. And it can be hard to kill one, but you can get them on a really good pattern. But early season is when I've killed the most mature bucks. In a rut, I see the most bucks. You see a lot of two, three-year-olds running around, a lot of them that I would shoot in a heartbeat. But early scene is when I kill the, the re really big, uh, mature, old bucks. I mean, they move in daylight. They're still on a summer pattern. You got to remember when I say that, though, we start mid-September. But I would say it, that even goes into, I've had pretty good luck into about the first few days of October. I think once mm -hmm. you get past that first week, it starts... Uh, to drop off significantly until rut. But uh, the first couple of weeks of the season are the best for me. Um, the first week of the season in, in Wisconsin has, has been phenomenal for me. I've shot in a few mature bucks right on opening day that I've been watching. Um, yep. <clears throat> Bill asked if we've ever thought about uh, quit to quit filming if it took away from hunting. Well, uh, it does take away from hunting, but I wouldn't say it's good or bad. It's just different. So um, it's definitely um, altered what I kill, and um, and it's altered uh, my success in certain ways. But it's a it's a matter of what your goals are. I mean, um, there's people film for different reasons, and people don't film for different reasons. I mean, some people that film want to be famous. So, some people want to help people, like myself. Um, some people, um, you know, they just want to be well known as a good hunter or something. Um, but you definitely don't do as well um, filming. And the filming also, like I said earlier, attracts um, people to hunt your spots and your areas. And they try to figure you out um, where just being on if you just want to kill big bucks and put them on your wall the best thing you can do is be unknown mm -hmm. and only the people you care about know about the bucks you shoot that's the best way but to some degree i mean if you're shooting big bucks it's because um you, you kind of want to show that off whether you want to admit that or not it's no different than being a football star you don't want nobody to know you're a football star or a rock star of course you want people to know that so it's kind of a catch 22, but, um, it doesn't cross my mind to quit. 
I mean, um, uh, I'd be more likely to quit hunting and keep filming, making films about hunting than I would be to quit filming and continue hunting. Yeah. Yeah. Filming is, it's almost like a passion for me now. Like I, I love doing it. Um, it wasn't always like that. Like I've had times in my life where I went on and off filming, you know, um, yeah. I grown to really enjoy that process of the hunt now. Yeah, it, it's, it's funny because uh, I think anybody you talk to that's been doing it for a long time will tell you when they first started, they want to throw their camera in a river. Yeah, I yeah. did. I mean, the very first time I ever filmed hunting, I went on a trip to, to Iowa and it wasn't the first time I filmed. But it was the first time I did it seriously because I was, I was filming for a TV show at the time. And I went down there and I went to a new property. And the first day I picked this spot where it, is, it looked good. And a 150 inch buck comes walking out, walks right to me. I got the camera rolling and everything. And and I tried to force the shot in the film screen. And it was an easy shot. But because I was screwing around with the camera, trying to make this shot in the screen, I ended up shooting in the shoulder blade. And I was so worried about the camera, I didn't even realize I shot it in the shoulder, the shoulder blade. I thought I smoked it. And I get the can grab the camera instead of another arrow. And I filmed this thing run right underneath me and stand underneath me looking around. And then I realize it's not very hurt. And then I go for another arrow and just as I draw, it takes off. And then um, the very next day, I blew it on the biggest deer I've ever seen in my life. Um, a 200 plus inch, 12 point typical. Um, oh. We've talked about that buck in the past, that one that lived on that oxbow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I shot that one in the uh, spine, trying to force a shot on film, and and uh, didn't break its back. It ran off, and uh, which is a horrible, horrible um, weekend. But uh, I wanted to throw that camera in the river, and I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I stuck with it. And uh, you know, at first it's a struggle, but after a while, it's like a second hand, and it's like, uh, you know. We got guys that film with us who will tell you, well, I didn't turn the camera on. I forgot. I wasn't thinking about it. I was just thinking about the kill or, or I'm not turning the camera on because that buck was so big or, or whatever. For me and for you probably, Josh, it's secondhand nature. I mean, I'm not sure yeah. unless I'm turning the camera on. I mean, you, you know, it mm -hmm. wouldn't even cross my mind. Yeah, I turned the camera on before I grabbed my bow. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely not for everyone. Well, guys, we've been on here for, uh, we got to get to one more here. Elizabeth gave us a, another donation. Wow. Thanks. Thank Lord. you, Elizabeth. She asked, How does someone get to be friends with you to hunt with you? <laughs> Actually, like, it, that's not like out of the, it's not it's out not of the realm of possible. Because yeah. we invite people to come on our hunts. And uh, you've been around long enough. Maybe you get the invite. Yeah. You uh, probably need to um, send uh, Josh a private message um right before season or something and then one of our planned hunts maybe we'll make an invite yeah we uh I like this you know in illinois i'm going uh i'm meeting someone that's a fan of the show in illinois there uh and we took savannah to the battle of the bows mm -hmm. um we'll do that again for sure have like a uh not a competition i don't know what you want to call it just like a um, you'll have to probably submit some type of a, a form where you tell us why we should take you hunting and, and uh, pick someone. So if you just kind of pay attention and uh, we'll have kind of hunt giveaways per se, not not really giveaways, but we'll invite you to go on some of our challenges. Um, mm -hmm. Filming yourself hunts, hunting is uh, a pretty big part of that. Being able to do that is a you know, though, plus. I, I would I was really thinking about we should probably um, on some of these when we take somebody who's not a filmer or not very good at it, instead of insisting they film, I think we'd be better off getting somebody to film for them. Yeah. Right. Something, you know, yeah. Even, if I, gotta, even if I got to creak out that, uh, that wallet and pay a few bucks, you know, I'm cheap, but I think yeah. we'd be better off hiring somebody to do that and actually get film footage of that captures their story and their hunt. And right. Right. But, but we can do all that. And, and uh, I really like, you know, hunting with a few well-known people and a few people nobody's heard of. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't really matter how successful they are. I, you know, this is about the journey. 
Yeah. Um, that's for sure. And I, like, I think people really got, uh, cause Savannah was a, uh, not, she, you know, she wasn't real, a real experienced hunter. I think people were kind of like that, like mm-hmm. showing people, um, all, uh, you know, kind of mentoring someone for a hunt. All right, guys, we've been on here for well over an hour and a half now. So there's a whole, there's just a ton of people on tonight, a whole bunch of questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to, to all the questions. Um, hop back on in the next show. And we'll, we'll try to get to them for sure. Uh, everybody have a good night. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. I never said that this episode and forgot about it, but that all helps. Um, Happy 2023. Yep. Happy new year. Hopefully you guys shoot a big late season buck. See you everybody. Have a good night.